the very thought of Jesus. Those earthly treasures, they grow strangely dim. And all my longing and all my searching, Take a hymnal, page 543. When the roll is called up yonder, the choir come down on the last. Shake hands. Come on, young people. Everybody fellowship. Thank you.
I mean, glad to be in church tonight. Say amen. Amen. We're, we're delighted to be back. I know you are. We appreciate you being faithful tonight. And uh, never done this in my life. I don't think I ever have, but we've got three visiting preachers here tonight. And I think we ought to have about three t 10 or 12 minute messages. So we want Brother Finley and Brother brother um, from Silica Springs, brother, brother, whatever, Brother Elder and Brother Jones. I want you three men to get ready to preach for us. All right. That's what I want. You say, that's crazy. Well, we're crazy anyway, amen? So we're just glad to be saved. Let's let the youth choir sing. I think it'll be good. I think it'll be good. My voice is shot. I'll say amen to them. And I know that makes them nervous as a tomcat, but they've been put in those positions before. And uh, who knows, we might get a woman to preach to in a little bit, all right? No, we're not. Let's worship God with these young people, all right? Come on, Bring it
Thank you, young people. We appreciate it, each and every one of you. May God bless you tonight. I will say this to the young people and the youth choir and the parents of the building. Uh, that, of course, school starts back tomorrow morning, but we've received word that uh, there are entire family of children sick and not able to be here, so I doubt someone will be at school tomorrow. We've got sickness and a lot of little children, so if your children are feverish or got other stuff going on, maybe it'd be good to, well, no, maybe be best to keep them away from school tomorrow, okay? So keep all that in mind, but we're glad you're here. We're going to get Brother Elder on the way up here to the choir loft, Brother Elder. We're going to let these three preachers preach in a little bit, but right now, we want to make all the announcements of the week, and we want to tell you also we'll have church Wednesday night at 7.30. Be glad to have you Wednesday night at 7.30, and uh, we're going to get the, go ahead and have a seat, preacher, if you will, but uh, right now, let's have the ushers come on in. We'll get the regular tithe and the regular offering. I'm kind of looking forward, no kind of about I am looking forward, hearing these men preach tonight. We're glad they're all here. Uh, y'all, y'all get ready with a song, all right? Y'all get in place and get ready with a song, and then we'll have our first preacher. And again, we've got sickness and adults sick, but we're glad a lot of you, most of you are here, and wherever you're from, welcome to Mountain View Baptist Church, and may the Lord minister to your heart, all right? Now listen, this is the first Sunday of the new year, first Sunday of the new year, and you ought to go ahead and start it off right financially, amen? Start it out right financially, and let God bless your heart, all right? The ushers are going to serve you. You go right ahead and play for us, all right? They got bulletins, too. Dr. Love, could you come pray with us, Dr. Love? Dr. Love's going to pray with us. Let's bow our head, close our eyes. We'll have two songs after this. We're going to get Brother uh, brother Elder, then we're going to get Brother Fenley, and we're going to close out Brother Jones. All right, that's the Lord's will for tonight. Seems like you worship the Lord in, your, in this prayer time given. All right, God bless you. Father, we come before you on this first Lord's Day of the year, looking forward to that, what you are going to do this coming year. Father, you are the God of the impossible, the God that makes dreams come true. Father, I pray tonight that you would cause us to look into this new year with anticipation, waiting upon you for your will in our lives. Father, we thank you for the offering. We pray that you would take it and use it to the honor and glory of thy son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Remember to pray for the school personnel as we start back the second semester. Hope to see everybody bright and cheerful on tomorrow. All right? Y'all ready? This is Brother Jimmy Owens, and so, let's see, yeah, his boy, yeah, all of his boys, all right? And then we got bro- Brother Andrew on the, uh, on the, that's a mandolin? That's a mandolin, all right? You worship us while we sing. Sit 
the talent. I really do. Y'all ready? All right, Brother Galloway and Malia and Derek, and then they'll uh, finish out. And again, let me say to you, all of you, please be faithful this Wednesday night. Love to have you. If you're visiting with us tonight, we have service every Wednesday night, 730, except inclement weather, something like that. We'd be honored to have you for the Wednesday night service. All right, y'all ready? All right, come on. Feel like a little mosquito trying to stir up a little bit of wind after a tornado blew through. <laughs> there, that sounded good, Brother Jimmy. Glad I'm saved tonight. Yeah. Glad I know my name is written there. Right. Right. He's worthy of my praise. <clears throat> Great. 
the songs you need to plug into your CD player, MP3, whatever, Bluetooth going down the road, and nobody there but you and the Lord. Amen. Yeah. Worship him in the beauty of holy. We've got a great crowd here tonight. In spite of, I'm telling you, this list I have, you wouldn't believe it. We have whole entire families out tonight because of sickness, but we're glad you're well and glad you're here. I appreciate friends in the gospel. I really do. This man's our friend, and I'm glad he's our friend. He pastors just over the way over here in Gaffney, outside it. Well, I don't think you can get here from here, but anyway, it's way out there in Gaffney somewhere. But this is Brother Billy Elder, and he's going to give us about 10 minutes, and then we're going to have a second preacher, and then we'll have a third, all right? Come on, Brother Elder. I'm going to go ahead and sit up here just so I can kind of say amen to him, all right? Amen, amen. Thank you so much. Turn your mic on. Amen, amen. And I want to tell you how much I appreciate the opportunity to be in the pulpit tonight. It is a blessing uh, to have another man have enough confidence in you to allow you into his pulpit. And I thank God for that. I thank God for the ministry here at Mountain View Baptist Church. Well, y'all are a blessing to those around you. First Corinthians chapter number 11. If you have your Bible with you, we're going to be starting down in verse number one. I just want to point out a few things unto you. If I can figure out this crazy thing here, amen. Let's see. Now you should be. Oh, we good. Good. Yeah, you're, you're good. Simple thing called a switch. I haven't learned it yet, amen. First Corinthians chapter eleven. I want to thank the Lord for the direction that He gives this book is full of instruction that is profitable. And when we get into First Corinthians eleven, it is dealing with order. As you get towards the end of the end of the chapter, it's going to deal with the ordinance. But at the very first of it, it's going to deal with an order. In verse number one, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. I think about how that there's an order set up and how that you ought to follow the preacher. Amen. Not only are you following the preacher, but if the preacher is following the Lord, you're also following Christ. In verse number one. Also, you'll notice that the ordinances is mentioned that they should be followed in verse number two. Now, I praise you, brethren, that you remember the, me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered from uh, delivered them to you. You know, of course, in a Baptist church, there are two ordinances. That is the ordinance of baptism and also the ordinance of the Lord's table. There's some that say that you ought to include the ordinance of foot washing. They've never dealt with Baptists. If we need anything, we need mouth washing. Amen? I've seen some of you post on Facebook. We need mouth washing more than anything now. But as we look through this, we notice that there's also more into the order in verse number three about how wives, you ought to follow your husbands. In verse three, but I would you know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is the man. Now listen, I want to make, put everything in the proper order. I know the man is the head of the house, but the woman is the neck and she'll turn you every which way but loose, amen? And that's why the women guide the house, as the Bible describes. We go through to where there's also a godly order that's put in, a godly nature. Uh, as far as nature is concerned, an order that's put there in verses 4 through 16. How that we know that there's a certain order as far as uh, who can cover their head. That's with the hair. Amen. Uh, we know it's a shame for a man to have long hair. But as you get into the last half of this chapter... It's going to deal with the ordinance of the Lord's table. Now, I'm not going to deal with it specifically, but I wanted to give you a background with what's going on up until now. I believe that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And I believe that everything the Lord has for you is decent and in order. Even the times when you think your life is in disorder. Now, when you go into this, starting at about verse number 17, you'll find out that there were certain divisions in the church at Corinth. And I find that most churches have this to some degree. I honestly believe that we pastor three different churches inside our uh, congregation. We have some that are with us. We have some that are against us. And we have some that just don't know what's going on. And when you look at this, how Paul addressed these divisions, he was fixing to start this thing of the order of the Lord's table. 
And as he started to describe it in verse number 23, you'll see how that he says, For I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Now, I don't know about you, we uh, tend to look at a fellowship or a meal as something uh, that's a, a time for joy. It's a time for enjoying one another. It's a time of, uh, it's not a sorrowful thing. But the night that our Lord was betrayed, he took bread. Not only did he know what was fixing to happen, and yet he decided to fix a table there in the midst of his enemies. But if you'll look in the next verse, and when he had given thanks. Now, I, I don't know about you, but my, my life is not always sunshine and rainbows. And knowing that this is not our home. While we're just a passing through, my treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Gives me a sense of joy that goes on beyond what my happiness is. You can have joy and not be happy about the circumstances. Happiness is based on happiness. Many of you know that my wife went on to be with the Lord some five months ago. And I find that the Bible says, in all things give thanks. Now listen, there are things that you can look at and think, man, this is going to kill me. But the Lord have good intended for you. Um, several years ago, my wife and I, we experienced this thing of a miscarriage. And it was before my son came along. It was our first child. And uh, any of you that have ever been through a tragedy like that, you'll know that it can hurt. When you're expecting the baby, you've already picked out names, you're already uh, ready to put things uh, in order there at the house. It tore her up and it tore me up. What do you mean the baby's not growing? Lord, I, I thought you were going to do good by us. Why do the righteous suffer? And I found a, a scripture, and listen, to this wasn't me finding it, it was the Lord finding it through someone else and passing it to me. Iron sharpeneth iron. You want to find out why you show up to church? Amen. You show up to help others. And listen, encouraging even so much more as you see the day approaching. Uh, people uh, that are coming to church, listen, you may not realize who is getting the benefit out of your attendance. You come into church dragging that leg or on crutches or in a wheelchair. And you've got cancer. You've got this going. You've got that going. You've got problems. And somebody's sitting there going, God, I wish I had their faith like that. In the book of Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 12, you'll remember that Paul is in the worst place that he could possibly be. He is in Nero's prison. And that is a prison epistle. He writes more about joy and rejoicing in the Lord in the book of Philippians than in any other book. But the one thing that he struck me with in verse number 12, he said, Brethren, I just not have you to be ignorant that the things that have happened to me have fallen out rather into the furtherance of the gospel. He was saying, I know it's bad, but it's happened that the gospel of Jesus Christ might go out further. Listen, let me tell you something. The things you go through, church, might not be for you. It might be for those that are watching you. And they need to see Christ work through your life. People were coming up to me, and they still are today. Uh, they went to the funeral. They went. They saw the. Uh, they saw my wife there on the video. You know, three days before she died, and we're all in there singing. She's raising her hand, praising God. She's telling us that I don't feel like I'm dying. You know what it was? I believe it was God's grace. Listen, I believe that there was those that needed to see someone that was going through a trial and they needed to see the Lord Jesus Christ work and walk through with them because, listen, I want to tell you something, it is great to be in the family of God and to have not only my sins forgiven and know where my eternity is, but to know I have a friend that sticketh closer than a brother and when I go through these things... I go not alone. Yeah. I'll tell you something. There's some of you tonight, you're battling some terrible things. You may be battling things in your mind. Do you know, listen, I was state trooper 17 years. Do you know how many dead bodies I've seen? 
you know how many nights I've woke up and remembered this intersection or this ditch or this time over here? Listen, it's good to know that one of these days God's going to take you and he's going to wipe all that out. Amen. I can rejoice in the things of God and know that even though I may be broken right now, my mind may not be where it is. Yeah, when I have the full mind of Christ, he has given it to us. If I will ingest it as a roll, I'll eat that scroll. Man, what a day that will be. When this is taken away and we see exactly why we went through all those trials, all those troubles. You know what? It was that God could get the glory out of us. Peter said it best. I believe it was in 1 Peter 4. He said, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which shall try you as though some strange thing had happened unto you. But rejoice in so much that you are partakers of the sufferings of Christ. God bless you. Amen. Thank you so much, brother. Take it up. Brother. Take it up. Yes. If, if that wasn't worth your drive here, I'll buy your gas on the way home. That ought to have been worth your trip here. Thank you. Thank you. Five months ago, five months ago, said goodbye to the dearest on earth to him. But yet God's grace allowed him strength to come up here and preach. And give us God's message. And you look around and the trial, come on, Brother Finley, the trial you're going through, what's happening in your family, in your life, folks, look at it in its right perspective. Amen. There's so many other things going on. I appreciate this preacher, his family, showing his family to stand. Do, do you know, do, you, do, do all the Mountain View people know who his family is? Y'all stand up, all right? This is his son. That's his son in the Burgundy. And uh, yes, and uh, uh, in laws over here daughters, uh, grandchildren, so uh, he's got a real connection to Mountain View. Thank you so much, and uh, and let's see, now, y'all the ones opened up the restaurant in Gaffney, right? Have you got it opened yet? And But when you do, right, according to him, like what he told me the other day, you're going to be giving out coupons for members only, something like that? Like, was it, did you tell me 75% off? I think, yeah. That's what we talked about. We, we done agreed. We've done claimed that in Jesus' name. All right? So I love this man. He's so kind. Brother Elder, so, so great. So great. Thank you. Thank you. That helped me too. Thank you. Brother Finley, give us about 10 minutes. We really appreciate it. Okay. Turn your mic on. Turn your mic. I believe it's already on. I think so. Are we already on? I believe we are. Okay. You never know what this man's going to do, do you? How many of y'all heard him say Wednesday night he was going to preach 15 minutes and then was going to fellowship hall? That didn't happen, did it? So don't you expect me to do that. <laughs> All right, I'm going to condense this little old text found in Matthew 14. And uh, I'm going to read verse, beginning in verse 22. Thank you, Billy. Uh, I tell you, if I've ever seen God's grace working in a man's life, uh, when his wife uh, went on to be with the Lord, it's in Billy Elder. Certainly is. Thank you, church. In verse tw uh, 22 in Matthew 14, the Bible says, And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitude away. And when he had sent the multitude away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray, and when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. For just a few moments, I want to think with you on the thought that, uh, tonight on being in the storms of obedience. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Most of us uh, don't have, are not Bible scholars, including myself tonight. But everybody knows a little bit about Jonah. Jonah in chapter 1 received the call from God to go to Tarsus and to preach a message to Nineveh that in 90 days, if you do not repent, I'm going to destroy the whole city. Jonah disobeyed God. He bought a ticket, got on a ship, and sailed to Tarsus thinking he could run from the presence of the Lord. And he disobeyed God, and when he got on the ship, he was later thrown overboard and swallowed by a whale. 
I heard it said that because he disobeyed God, God gave him an all expense paid three days and three nights in the belly of an underwater hotel called a whale. And anyway, it's a whale of a story either way you look at it tonight. But, but he got in trouble with God because he disobeyed him. I want to tell you tonight, and I want to go on record as saying tonight, that if we disobey God, there's a storm going to come your way tonight. But this story here is entirely different. Did you know that you can be here at the church every time the doors open? You can be in Sunday school. You can be in worship service. You can go out and testify and witness. You can give your tithe. And you still sometimes are going to get in a storm. They're called storms of obedience. If we obey God, you're either coming out of one, in one, or fixing to go into another one. I want to tell you tonight, there are storms of obedience. I want you to notice, first of all, that the storm was planned. Jesus had just taken five loaves and two fishes and fed 5,000 men and also women and children, probably over 10,000. And no sooner had they come off that mountain that Jesus said to his disciples, I want you to get into a ship and I want you to go to the other side. And when they did that, the Bible said they got in a storm out in the middle of the sea. I want you, I want you to understand tonight that God has storms planned for you and I. You may not understand it, but I want you to understand it that when you get through it, you'll be more like him when you get on the other side. God has storms planned for us. But then I want you to notice that the, the Bible said that the Savior was praying for them. The Bible said that he went up into a mountain apart to pray. There was observation. Mark chapter 6 says that Jesus saw them toiling and rowing. You know what the devil tries to tell you and me when we get in our storms? You've disobeyed God. You've sinned against God. That might be true, but it might not be true. And he tells us that God doesn't know where you are. Listen, there's not a second, a minute, an hour of a day that he does not know who we are and where we are tonight. He sees us in the storms of obedience in our life. But not only observation, the Bible says intercession. The Bible said that he went up there to pray. Now, I'll tell you something tonight. I appreciate your prayers tonight when I'm having my storms. But it really makes me feel good tonight that the Son of God is praying for me in the midst of my storms tonight. The Bible said that he went up there to pray. Hebrews 7.25 says that he ever lives to make intercession for all of us tonight. I don't know what you're going through tonight. Some of you are going through things that only you and God know about. But listen, you're not in it by yourself tonight. It might just be one of those storms of obedience that God has planned for you. Not only was the Savior praying, but the Bible said also that the Savior was present with them in their storms. You're not going to stay in it forever. The Bible said he came to them. The Bible said he walked on the water. I don't know any other man that could ever done that. The Bible said, what manner of man is this? And even the wind and the seas obey his voice. The Bible said that he came in victory. He's walking over the very thing that was scaring the life out of them. I'm saying that he walked in victory. But I want you to notice that their vision was blurred. They didn't even recognize him. They thought he was a ghost. They said it was an apparition. You know, did you know when we least recognize him in our walk with God is when we get in these storms of life? Folks, I want to tell you something tonight. It's, start, it's time that we start living by faith and realize that he will never leave us nor forsake us. The Bible tells us that the Savior will be present in your storms. But also, the saints are being perfected. You know what happened here? The Bible gives us a story of how that Jesus said to them, why are you so afraid? You know why? When he, when, he, when he raised that question and he told them not to be afraid, he wanted them to denounce their fears. There are a lot of you here tonight that are scared half to death because of what you're going through. 
The Bible says in John chapter 10 that we have a shepherd who will, the Bible says that we're in his hand and we will never perish, neither can any man pluck us out tonight. He wants you to denounce your fears, but he wants to develop your faith. Now Simon Peter says, he says, Lord, bid me to come unto thee on the water. And Jesus uh, said, come, and gave him an invitation. And when he began to walk, he got his eyes off Jesus and he began to sink. In these storms of obedience, exercise your faith. Be totally obedient and keep your eyes on him. I'm telling you tonight that he's trying to make us more like himself. Nobody ever did what he did. Nobody is as great as he is. What sets him apart from all the other so-called religions of the world? He's the only one that's ever risen from the dead. And he lives in the hearts and lives of all of his children. I want to quickly mention to you, the Savior should always be praised. The Bible said that when Jesus got on board, the wind ceased. They acknowledged his power. And then the Bible said they worshiped him. They adored his person. I want to tell you something. My heart and life is empty when I don't worship. I don't know what's happening to these church members today that you've got to beg them to come to the house of God. You realize who we're coming here to meet today? We're meeting the one that bled and died for us and rose from the dead for us. You might say, preacher, I'm going through a storm right now. And you might say, I guess I've disobeyed God. That may not be true. It might be that you're just having one of them old storms of obedience. And you stay in that storm. And he'll show up. And you'll make it to the other side. Praise God. Amen, brother. Amen. Take, take that microphone right back to Brother Jones. Okay, I will. Say amen to that. I'll only stay in that storm, but I'll tell you what else you better do, and I know he put that in there. You better stay in that ship. Amen. Stay in that ship. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much. That was well worth the drive as well. Great, great, great. I didn't even know you were going to be here. Glad you're here. Now, is your family back here? Now, did y'all know this is Andrew's dad? You, you knew that, right? Congregate, you, you knew that, and Mary Beth's father-in-law and and the grandchildren's great grandfather, all right? So uh, we're glad they're here. Preacher, you close this out if you will. Turn your mic on. Turn that mic on. God bless you, sir. Uh, First Peter chapter 5. I am thankful for the opportunity uh, to be here. And I'm not sure. Why the Lord does that, but I can trust him. Amen. We love this place and God meets with us here and I'm thankful for that. And uh, your kindness to us and our family, we're grateful for that. And ask the Lord to return it back to you. The book of 1 Peter chapter 5. And uh, we'll read 14 verses, but I'm not going to be long. All right, 14 verses. The Bible says, the elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject to one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, 
knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, established, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. By Slovenius, a faithful brother unto you, as I suppose I have written briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein you stand. The church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you, and so doth Marcus, my son. Greet ye one another with the kiss of charity. Peace be with you all that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. A while back I preached out of the book of 1 Peter chapter 1. And I preached the concentration during our suffering. Uh, the book of First and Second Peter is written to folks that are suffering. Uh, their suffering is much different than our suffering. We suffer when the air conditioner uh, goes out, but their suffering is living uh, in them. They're, they're, they're worried about uh, whether they're going to survive the night or not for the cause of Christ. But whatever it is that you're suffering with, the book of 1 Peter has those answers. Uh, we looked at the concentration during our suffering. The Holy Ghost reminded this church that uh, Jesus' blood is the concentration. We're to focus not on our trial, but rather the blood of Christ and all of what he went through to deliver us. In chapter 2, he tells us about our our uh, conduct, chapters 2 and 3, our conduct during our suffering. Uh, we are not to change. We are supposed to live just the same way we are when we are on top of the mountain and everything's going good. In chapter 4, he reminds them that even in their suffering, he will start to judgment. In fact, he said in chapter 4, judgment will begin at the house of God. He said, even though you're suffering, he said, I will judge sin. But in chapter 5, I've called it the cistern during our suffering. If we're looking at the text, and we don't have a lot of time, but you'll notice that he's got a list of chores for these people. He tells them in chapter 1, those who are above, those who are leading the church, that they're to live a life that those who are watching can uh, I have it as an example. There's to live above all of what uh, this world uh, is trying to tempt them with. And he said to them, feed the flock of God. He said not to do it for filthy lucre's sake. Look in, look in verse 3. He tells them that they're not to be lords over God's heritage, but to be in examples. Then he tells them in verse uh, 5, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Look at this. Yea, all of you be subject one to another. I don't know how you would start out a letter to folks who are suffering, but this is not my idea of how to end a letter written to people who are suffering. Uh, but yet God doesn't ease it up. He lays it on them. He tells them to feed the flock of God. I know that you're suffering. I understand that you're scattered. I understand society uh, is fed up with you. He said, but I want you to remember there's work to be done. He said, feed the flock of God. He said, submit yourselves one to another. I'm going to tell you, that's tough to do when you're suffering. But yet he sells them. He's ending the chapter. He's ending this first letter. He's telling them, you do it. Submit yourselves. I like verse 6. He tells them to humble themselves under the mighty hand of God. I like to humble myself when everything's going good. I can sit back and say, yes, sir, God's been good to me. But when I'm going through the tall grass, uh, when I'm heavy laden, it's hard to submit yourself or humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. He says in verse 7, casting all your care. That's, that's a verse right there that makes me tremble. You say, why? Because it's a lot of work. He didn't say pray about everything that you can't handle and then uh, you go ahead and take care of the rest. He tells a group of people who are suffering to put it all on God, casting all your care. I don't know if you're seeing it or not tonight, church, but he is not letting it up at all. 
He is telling these suffering group of people, you keep going, you keep marching. Yeah. Then he starts to tell them in verse 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is walking up. I mean, there's not a lick of good news thus far. Everything I'm reading is do this, do that. By the way, there's someone looking to destroy your life. But right in the middle of it all, God butts in. And he tells them in verse 10, but the God of all grace. I'm thankful tonight that he is the God of all grace. I'm going to tell you I could say it like this and not be a Bible corrector. He is the God of every kind of grace. For the next four minutes tonight, I want to preach on this thought. The God of all grace. Uh, I want to say this, this evening that he is the God of saving grace. Uh, I'm glad tonight that he is the God that calls sinners to repentance. Uh, I'm glad tonight uh, that he is the God of saving grace. Uh, that saving grace uh, is God takes an undeserving sinner whose life is stained with dirty living and washes them in his blood. He is the God of saving grace. I'm going to tell you I'm thankful tonight to tell sinners that they're nothing without God, that they've got hell waiting for them. But I'm glad tonight to report to them that there's a God in heaven who saves their ever dying. I'm tonight he's the God of saving grace. I'm going to bust this up. I'm sorry. He's the God of saving grace. I'm going to tell you, grace is unmerited favor. I don't know how you define it, but I know how the Bible defines it. Unmerited favor. I was minding my business when the Holy Ghost of God came to 1847 Thumb Road uh, in the middle of nowhere and interrupted my life uh, with his saving grace. Uh, I'm going to tell you, there was nothing in me that would make God more of God, uh, but he saved me tonight. Uh, he sought me out, uh, called me by his amazing grace, and saved me. He's the God of saving grace. He's also the God tonight of serving grace. I would never come up before a small crowd or a big crowd in the, in, the fle in the flesh, in the strength of my own ability. There's no way that I would serve God in my own ability. There's no way it can be done. Uh, there's not enough talent. Uh, there's not enough commentaries. Uh, there's not enough uh, uh, songs to be able to build up the crowd. God can do it, though. Uh, he's the God of serving grace. How in the world can we as men and women serve someone as holy and high as him? How in the world can God take someone as filthy as us? And let us take the message that transforms lives. How can he do that tonight? I'll tell you how. He's the God of serving grace. He pours it out upon his people so that they're able to serve him. I have no idea what unction is. No idea. And neither do you. Somebody say amen right there. I've met some that think they do. But unction comes from a lot more than just yelling. I've heard a lot of yelling and walked away with what in the world was that about. It takes more than yelling. But I tell you, I don't know what unction is, but I sure know when I've done it without it. Boy, I tell you, I've walked back to my pew knowing I've messed it all up. Uh, I'm going to tell you, I don't want to get up here, whether I'm singing or teaching a Sunday school class, uh, whether I'm singing in the choir or taking up the offering. I don't want to do it in my own strength. Uh, and I'm glad to report to you tonight, church, uh, there's a God in heaven uh, who pours out that unmerited favor and lets us serve him. He's the God of serving grace. Every mama and daddy in this building, you can't do it right without that grace. Every Sunday school teacher in this building tonight and listening by way of internet, you can't do it without God's grace. He's the God of serving grace. Paul said, I am what I am because of the grace of God. He's the God of serving grace. He's the God of suffering grace. I don't know how in the world some people go through the things that they go through. I heard it tonight. 
I've heard it tonight. I, God has kept me from a lot of things. And, uh, but I've, I've gone through the deep grass too. But I'll promise you this though. There's folks that have gone through a lot deeper valleys than I'll ever see thus far. And I don't know, I don't know how some make it through. I've pastored some who really went through it. I watched them. Boy, they, they buried two of their children in one year. Took them out to the graveyard and put them in the ground. Good kids, love the Lord. Like the preacher said, it was one of those that they weren't doing nothing wrong. There was no sin in their lives. And boy, I tell you, as they walked through that valley, that Sunday morning I was praying for them and said, Lord, you know where they're at. You know what they're going through. And here they come through the doors of the house of God. That Sunday morning, sat in the pew, sang Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. And I've watched other ones go through something small and simple. Boy, they get mad at God and blame God for everything. They never will darken the door of a Baptist church again because they went through it. And I thought to myself, what's the difference? How does one go through such deep water and one go through shallow water and one fall out and the other one stay faithful? I tell you how. The God of all grace pours out that suffering grace. I don't know. I don't want to die a quitter. I don't want my kids to have to walk past me when they bury me and say dad did the best he could but he just couldn't finish. I want them to look at my casket and say dad wasn't a quitter. He stayed with it and I'll promise you this church there ain't but one way we're finishing this race. It's if the God of all grace pours it out on us. He's the God of serving grace, suffering grace. He's the God of standing grace. I'm going to tell you, in a day of compromise, everybody's walking off the hill. We need some good men and women to stand. And I'll tell you, the only way we're going to stand is with God's favor. Oh, I know you're talking big now, but you ain't got no kids. I've, I've preached for some, boy, they stand against everything till the kids messed up. Now all of a sudden, those flags lowered. Now they've walked off the top of the hill. They ain't barking like they used to bark. I'm going to tell you, they're good men, but you know what they forgot, son? Some of that standing grace. I tell you, it takes God's grace to stand. I say this tonight. I was wondering, could you help me finish the verse? You have not because you... It's amazing to me how much grace God has. In fact, it'll never run out. It'll never run out. God has enough grace for every problem in this room. But you know what he says? He resisteth the proud. And he giveth grace to the humble. I like the word resisteth. It's a football word. It means stiff arm. You know, you got the ball. And God says, I got grace right here. He said, but I stiff arm the proud but he said I give grace to the humble there's a lot of folks that miss out on this you know why because they're too prideful to ask for it I'm done but there's a story I read a story about a fellow who was an advisor for Mr. Alexander Great Mr. Alexander Great I'm sure you've heard of him he was a known conqueror of the world in his day but he had a an aide, someone he would go to that he was fond of. And that fellow helped him out an awful lot during his reign. So Mr. Alexander Great made this offer. He said, you ask for anything and I'll give it to you. That fellow got to thinking, boy, anything? Anything. Mr. Alexander walked away. That fellow got to thinking about the stuff that he needs in his life. So he took out a piece of paper and wrote a amount of money on it. With a lot of zeros. Took that. Gets quiet in the Baptist church when you talk about money. Took that piece of paper and folded it up and handed it to Mr. Alexander, great secretary. He looked at that, opened it up, and saw all those zeros. And said, how dare you insult Mr. Alexander this way. He gave you a legit offer to ask for anything. And you asked for this. He said, I won't give it to you until I talk to Mr. Alexander myself. So that secretary went in and knocked on the door. Mr. Alexander was sitting at his desk. He said, come in. He said, do you remember the fellow that you gave the invitation to ask for anything? He said, yes. 
He said, this is what he's asked for. He handed him the folded piece of paper and he opened it up and saw all those circles, them zeros, and a smile come across his face. He said, my, that's a lot to ask for, but it's not a lot for Mr. Alexander to give. Give it to him. I was wondering, what do you have that's a lot to ask for? It may be a lot. You may need the God of all grace to pour out some of the most extreme requests. But you already said, you have not because you. And here's what he said. It might be a lot, but it's not a lot for him to give. He's the God of all grace. Thank you, preacher. Sure don't want to be stiff armed. Let's bow our head and let's close our eyes. I believe that through all three of these vessels this evening, I truly believe we've heard from the Lord. Through all three of them. Have you asked lately for the grace that you need? to get through what you're going through. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, bless Lord as we sing a song and take a few minutes to not be in such a hurry. Lord, I know there's so many needs in this congregation tonight. And I ask you, Heavenly Father, to specifically and personally minister to the hearts and lives of people right now. Minister as only you can. Tell us what we need to do. Tell us how we need to respond. Give us grace, Lord, and strength and humility to ask of our Heavenly Father what we need. Help us tonight. Thank you for these preachers. Every one of them, Lord, it has been such a blessing. And I pray you'll bless them as they leave here tonight. Bless as we sing now. In Jesus' name, amen. Page 371. There's several here all over the altars.